Anyone who has been around the gaming sphere for a moderate amount of time has probably encountered a certain term floating around a lot of games, especially modern ones, particularly when referencing certain specific developers. <coughs> Ubisoft! <coughs> Blizzard! <coughs> the term in question is pay to win, which essentially encapsulates the idea that things like playtime, experience, and raw skill are less important than the amount of money spent in a particular game when determining who is most likely to come out on top. As such, there's a reason that such pay-to-win systems, when implemented into a game, are so abhorred by the gaming community at large. However, behind every pay-to-win game, there's always a more sinister force at work. These games tend to be heavily monetized, and in a lot of cases, monetized in an extremely predatory way, either utilizing psychological manipulation to convince players that one small purchase won't hurt, as it's much easier to get them to spend more once they've already spent a little, or simply beating them into submission with the simple fact that at a certain point in the game, you actually can't progress any further without spending more money. Sometimes, the worst perpetrators will even utilize both of these strategies in tandem, designed to leech every single penny they possibly can out of their player base, in a shameless display of corporate greed. <coughs> Bethesda. <coughs> Sorry, I think I have something stuck in my throat today or something. <laughs> Weird. Anyways, as the title of the video might suggest, I recently got notified that I've hit the Praetorian Concierge tier in Star Citizen, indicating that I've spent quite a bit of money on the game. Easily the most money I've ever spent on a single video game, in fact. So how did I end up spending all that money in one place? Is Star Citizen a pay-to-win game? Well, that's what I'm going to be covering in this video. Along the way, we'll also be looking at the validity of the claims of many people, including the always very trustworthy and impartial modern game journalist outlets, that Star Citizen is a pay-to-win game, featuring heavy monetization and forceful microtransactions. Before we get into things though, if this is your first time here, consider subscribing to support me and my channel. Also, feel free to check out my Discord server, where we've got a great community of Star Citizens who are very friendly to newer players. Link in the video description. Now then, I have a lot to talk about, so let's dive into this video, shall we? The main goal of this video will be to determine how on earth I ended up spending so much money on a single video game. In order to do this, we need to decide whether it's simply my fault for being a rather reckless spender, or if Star Citizen is heavily and predatorily monetized, like so many AAA titles nowadays. And since a lot of those heavily monetized games are also considered to be pay to win, we'll be looking to answer the question of whether or not people accusing Star Citizen of being pay to win are correct in making that accusation. So I think a good place to start is by defining what pay to win actually entails. The Macmillan Dictionary defines pay to win as, in online gaming, the practice of buying in-game items that give the player a very big advantage over others. So let's break this down into two key points. Number one, the ability to purchase in-game items for real-world money. And number two, the ability to use real-world money purchases to gain an unfair advantage over other players. Let's look at some examples, shall we? Let's start with Blizzard. Blizzard can suck my dick. Sorry about that. I, I don't know what's going on with this video today. There's like weird audio glitches or something. Anyways, as I was saying, it's been pretty well documented that Blizzard's new Diablo Immortal is excruciatingly pay to win. 
Somehow, despite the absolutely disastrous announcement of the game a few years ago. Uh, are there any, uh, yeah, this, this, the current plan is to be on mobile, both uh, Android and iOS. Uh, we don't have any plans at the moment to do uh, PC. Do you guys not have phones? Yeah, you guys that all have phones. Phone. Blizzard managed to exceed our expectations by creating a game so horrendous, nobody could have possibly predicted the end result. A lot of the late game content involves running specific multiplayer dungeons, where after killing the boss, you're treated to a random variety of loot drops. In order to get the best of the best equipment, as well as the resources required to enhance and fully upgrade this equipment. Of course, under normal circumstances, you need to be extremely lucky, as the chances for the highest tier of equipment drop is incredibly rare. However, if you pay for a specific item from the online store that is not attainable through normal gameplay, you can enhance your loot drops, as well as the rate of getting the highest rarity of gear and materials enormously. In case there's any dispute as to what kind of a difference these specific luck boosting items make, here's a clip of a boss drop without using those items. And here's a clip of a boss drop using those items. As you might be able to tell, there's a slight difference in those drop rates. While Blizzard can try to weasel their way out of accusations by pointing out that those extremely high value legendary equipment and gems are technically possible to obtain without spending any money, the sheer rarity of these items make it functionally almost impossible to earn even a single one during normal gameplay while those who are paying for the luck-boosting items are snagging dozens of pieces of legendary equipment in a single run. These purchased items also have a secondary effect of also boosting the drop luck of whoever else is joining you in these multiplayer dungeons, creating a community that constantly checks and actively kicks free-to-play players out of their loot-boosted multiplayer dungeons. This has created a situation where even the most skilled players find themselves simply unable to do anything against the high-paying players in PvP matches, making almost every PvP match simply boil down to a victory for whoever has the deepest wallet. This is absolutely, unashamedly, a pay-to-win game. But let's take a look at another very popular game. The Legend of Weeb's Breath of the Waifu. Sorry, uh, Genshin Impact. Genshin Impact is an open-world, exploration-based RPG with multiplayer elements, raid bosses, dungeons, and more. The main feature of the game, however, is that it's a gacha game, and the boss and dungeon rewards require a type of stamina to obtain. You can only get a certain amount of stamina per day, but you can use a paid currency to recharge your stamina, allowing you to get rewards more often, giving you a higher chance to earn better gear and upgrade materials. This kind of stamina system is a common addition to gacha games like this, but I'll touch on that a little more later in the video. The gotcha system also uses a paid currency and features two different gotchas. One for characters that you can play as, and one for weapons that you can equip on your characters to buff their stats or augment their skills. Paying for the gotcha currency gives you additional opportunities to roll for unique characters with powerful skills or special weapons with stronger stats. In order to get your characters and weapons to their highest potential, you not only have to obtain them from the gacha, but obtain multiple copies of them in order to either boost the weapon's special buff, or to unlock special character abilities through something called the Constellation System. In this case, people can effectively pay to improve their chances of getting what they want from the gacha system, 
as well as increase the time they can spend farming. However, unlike the previous game we talked about, Genshin Impact does not feature any kind of dedicated PvP system. And while there are dungeons and raid bosses, these are all single-player or co-op multiplayer experiences. Additionally, while players can pay to get more stamina to run these dungeons more often, they still have the same loot drop rates as everyone else. So I wouldn't really classify this game as being pay to win, as while you can definitely gain an advantage over other players by spending more money, it doesn't really matter. The lack of a PvP system, as well as the comparatively minor advantages that the extra dungeon runs and gotcha pulls actually add, means there's really no inherent negative impact on others. However, just like in Diablo Immortal, there have been instances in Genshin Impact where if a player tries to join a multiplayer boss or dungeon while using a certain character, or if their character doesn't have a certain constellation upgrade level, they'll get kicked from the group. So it's definitely still a potential issue, though not quite as severe. So in light of this, where does Star Citizen stand on the pay-to-win spectrum? Well, there's certainly the ability to purchase starships with real-world money, as well as things like player armor sets, FPS weapons, and stuff like that on the online store. Where the difference lies, however, is that everything offered in the online store is also offered in-game. Subscriber store items can be found in loot crates in bunkers, caves, and other locations around the verse, and are usually just cosmetically unique versions of armor sets that can be easily purchased in various shops around the different stations and planetary landing zones. Starships as well can also be purchased in-game for surprisingly reasonable amounts of in-game currency. And every single ship that's sold on the store is also sold in-game. Plus, you don't have to worry about the in-game cost so much, because there's a lot of variety and options to make enormous amounts of currency very quickly. There are maybe two advantages to purchasing ships from the online store rather than in-game, but these advantages are also likely limited to while the game remains in alpha. The first, as we are all painfully aware, due to the recent 3.17.2 patch wipe, is that wipes can happen. Ships purchased from the online store will be available immediately following a wipe, whereas ships purchased in-game will be lost after the wipe. Second, newly flyable ships can take a patch or two before they are available to buy from the in-game dealers, so the advantages here are simply saving time and gaining some kind of early access to the ships. Star Citizen also features a PvP system, as players are encouraged to choose their own side of the law. Because of this, we frequently see skirmishes between lawful players and players who prefer to ignore the law. And while I may have spent money on certain ships which are considered to be at the top of their class, rather than farming to purchase it in-game, it's not possible to buy premium components for those ships using real-world money. This means that the options for upgrading ships are the same no matter how much you've spent on the game. Buying more ships doesn't help here either, as you can only fly one ship at a time, and in some cases need multiple players to properly crew the ship to make the most of that ship's capabilities, especially when it comes to the more expensive ships. And no matter how hard I've looked, there's certainly no option to buy skill, either. Trust me, I've tried. Anyways. Therefore, how much I may have spent on the game doesn't matter when it comes to PvP, as I'd almost certainly get clapped by anyone with more skill and experience, even if they've only ever made the minimum investment by buying a starter pack. So, I think we can safely say that while Star Citizen certainly provides the ability to pay for several things, 
those purchases simply don't translate into enough of a difference between a paying player and a non-paying player to approach anything even remotely resembling a pay-to-win game. So there's that part of the puzzle figured out at least. But let's look at how the game is actually monetized. Star Citizen's monetization strategy, aside from the initial Kickstarter that has long since ended, involves primarily selling game packages on their online store. For $45, you can grab a game package and an entry-level starter ship. Or for a bit more, you can start with a more expensive option. You can also purchase a copy of their upcoming standalone title, Squadron 42, for $45, or save a little if you get it included in one of the bundle packages. And if you wait for a free fly event, these packages are often discounted. But let's be real, this initial investment is not unlike any other pay to play game, where you have to purchase the ability to play the game. Additionally, every ship that is currently in concept or that is actively flyable in game is purchasable for real-world money on the online store, though the selection is usually fairly limited, as the majority of ships are only sold during special events, mainly held in the spring or the fall. There is also a subscription package that you can buy for various perks, such as newsletters, subscribership test drives, as well as monthly cosmetic items and the like. Interestingly, and also rather importantly, while the Star Citizen webpage is designed quite well to guide players towards where they can purchase a game package and other such things, monetization is notably absent from the in-game client. Never, while playing the game, will you see any type of pop-up or prompt informing you of sales, special offers, or anything to do with the online store. You might receive some emails telling you about the latest sales on the store, but even these you actually have to sign up for by opting into email offers. Or join a community that is actively monitoring what ships come and go from the online store. Returning to our two previous examples, we can see a pretty stark difference. Diablo Immortal, for example, has constant pop-ups for special offers and reminders that if you just spend a little bit of money, you can get better loot. While the game is ostensibly free to play, as in it has zero cost to actually get into the game, all monetization of the game is inherently tied into the game client and designed to pressure players into spending more money to be able to actively progress in the game. We can see this type of malicious monetization strategy in the vast majority of high-profile, online or multiplayer games nowadays. Games like World of Warcraft, Battlefront, Fallout 76, FIFA, Forza, Destiny 2, and more are all designed to be as predatory as possible, with systems designed and built into the game engine itself to pressure you into microtransactions, using pop-ups, false special deals, loot boxes, and even types of psychological manipulation to make you feel like you need to spend money on the game in order to progress or succeed. While many gotcha games like Genshin Impact are not explicitly pay to win, as they don't typically feature active PvP features many of these other games have, most, if not all of these games, are still designed in such a way as to pressure players into spending money. The gotcha system is essentially a glorified loot box, and is often paired with a stamina type system to make players feel like they need to spend money in order to keep up with other players who can pay to refill their stamina to keep grinding the game, even when there's no direct PvP system. Other things, such as inspiring the addictive desire to collect characters or items, also help drive people into rolling on these gotcha systems far more than they should. 
And that's not even getting into the gacha games that have immensely predatory drop rates, or those super scummy ones that feature PvP systems which make them explicitly pay to win, such as Sinnoh Alice, Fire Emblem Heroes, and Raid Shadow Legends. If you've been around on my channel for a while, you've probably heard my complaints and criticisms about many games nowadays being monetized in ways like this. I've also had a history of playing quite a few different gacha games before quitting all of them a few years ago due to being sick of these types of monetization strategies. I am also pretty clear about my distaste for companies like Bethesda, Blizzard, EA, and others for their blatantly predatory monetization strategies. Strategies found in many of their games using systems such as in-game cash shop items, loot box mechanics, paid drop rate or EXP boosts, and the list goes on to the point where I try to avoid purchasing games from these companies altogether. So with this in mind, why have I spent so much money on Star Citizen, a game that's not even finished yet? Well, there's a few reasons for that. The most overt reason being that I'm not exactly the wisest person around as far as managing money is concerned. I tend to overspend on things, especially when they're concerning my hobbies, and video games are no exception. I think a bigger reason, however, is that I simply found a game that I fell in love with and wanted to support. An awesome game that is still in development, but with so much potential. And while clearly looking to make a profit still, they don't seem to be trying to pressure me into any purchases through underhanded or nefarious means. And after having been subjected to a bombardment of predatorily monetized games for so long, finding something like this was a welcome change of pace. More than that, I wanted to support the developers of this beautiful game, to help them realize their dream, and to push the development of this game that, to me, seems like it has the potential to become something that pretty perfectly suits my tastes in what I want from a video game. So, where exactly did all that money go? Well, I've held a constant subscription package to the game since I started playing. There's also some subscriber cosmetic items and similar things that make a small impact on that figure as well. But obviously, the biggest contributing factor has been buying ships. While I have spent a decent amount on the various ship giveaways I've done on my channel, the majority has been spent on my personal fleet. I'm rather proud of my fleet as it stands, and you can check it out now as well. From the tiny and relatively inexpensive ground vehicles, all the way to the enormous Kraken Privateer, the largest and most expensive ship in my fleet. But what do you think? Do you feel like Star Citizen is a pay-to-win game? What's your most egregious example of a predatorily monetized or blatantly pay-to-win game? Let me know down in the video comments. I hope you all enjoyed this video. If you did, please subscribe to the channel and leave a like on the video. If you'd like to help support my channel, consider joining the membership for early access to new videos, emotes, badges, and more. Also, come join the Discord community, link in the video description. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you all in the verse.